I don't wanna be the boy that runs in the back I don't wanna be the kid that falls in the dark All I really want to be is the guy that gets that girl Welcome to the AJ Steele Show. We discuss politics, sex, money, and everything in between. And now, here's your host, an immigrant, a self-made millionaire, an American, AJ Steele. Welcome to the AJ Steele Show. Today we have a great interview with a man who has worn many, many hats in his lifetime and he's done many great things and he just happens to be a very smart individual. His name is Michael Johns. Even though Michael is relatively a young man, he's already had a chance to become a very influential conservative thinker. But he's not just your standard garden variety political insider. He's done quite a few different things, and he's taken some positions, some of which you might not even agree with, while most you're going to absolutely love. Now, as far as his resume, he worked as a speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush, and he spent some time as a policy analyst for the Heritage Foundation. But maybe even more important, he also happens to be the national co-founder and leader of the Tea Party movement, and he also spent many years as a high-level healthcare executive. So you know he has a lot to say and he has a lot of experience. In today's show, we cover so many different topics. We talked about COVID-19, the Tea Party. We talked about President Ronald Reagan and President Bush, who we knew very well, and we compared them to Donald Trump. Believe it or not, we even talked about President Trump's contributions to the African-American community. And we even had a great discussion about the looming threat of China. But before we start this fascinating and perhaps even surprising interview with Michael Johns, because I think you will learn a lot by listening to him. I want to thank all our wonderful listeners for their continued support of the AJ Steele Show. And I want to remind everyone to please subscribe to our podcast and spread the word about the work we're doing. Now, without any further ado, here's our interview with Mr. Michael Johns. Michael Johns, welcome to the AJ Steele Show. Hey, it's a pleasure, AJ. Thank you. Michael, I want to cover a lot of topics with you because you've been involved with so many things. But the elephant in the room right now is the COVID-19 virus from China. What are your thoughts on China, the WHO, and how we're dealing with the pandemic right here in the U.S.? Well, I have a broad number of thoughts on that. Um, Number one, as it relates to China, I think sadly and unfortunately, they were not at all forthcoming with us about um, the virus. I think they either misled or collaborated in misleading through the World Health Organization, the magnitude of uh, its viral nature. It, uh, I think the origins of it are uh, obviously still under investigation and um, you know, very intrigued as to what that's going to uncover. And uh, you have, um, I think, a great degree of ultimate financial responsibility that's going to fall back on China for this, how that's executed and um, how they're held accountable is, you know, a question mark at this point. But let me just say there's many options available to the United States with the magnitude of our engagement with China. I think there's every good reason to believe that they will be held accountable. I, I, I would urge them at this point to be very forthcoming, open and honest with the United States. Um, I think it's troubling that they didn't allow in the CDC right away. I think mm-hmm. it's troubling that they haven't been forthcoming and offering us the sampling or the access to patients that would have been helpful to us. And um, most troubling was the fact that they were so restrictive around Wuhan and in, in preventing travel and in quarantining uh, individuals in that area, and yet continued outrageously to allow their international travel to continue, and even denounced President Trump's very seasoned and correct judgment to suspend that travel the end of January as being, I think they called it an unfriendly measure, uh, when that was precisely what we needed to do. I think that Joe Biden and uh, Nancy Pelosi called that xenophobia, right? Now, what about the WHO? The World Health Organization, I think we've clearly seen in their management and involvement in this is highly politicized. 
they maintain an undeniable pro-China bias. It appears to me that they didn't independently audit many of the findings that they reported out of China, or if they did, they didn't audit them sufficiently. They seem to take China at its word, which uh, I don't believe they should take any country of the, of the world at its word, especially that country, which has a history of mm-hmm. um, tending to politicize and mislead. And uh, ultimately, we're going to have to, uh, once we're through all this, I guess, and well, actually it's already begun, reevaluate whether the World Health Organization can really live up to that broad name, You know, whether it can really serve that definitive global role as a um, authoritative force and source for public health in, around the world, and whether that can serve U.S. interests. Uh, to the U- UN Human Rights Commission is another great example of this, where these entities become so hugely politicized and so almost absurdly committed to a political versus a factual agenda that they become almost impossible to salvage. And in those cases, you can't be bashful about simply removing the country from it. I think that many Americans, including myself and uh, President Trump, for that matter, absolutely get it about the United Nations and all of these uh, NGOs and all of these so-called world groups that we sponsor. America gives more money to all of these groups than all the other countries of the world, and none of them seem to work for us. As a matter of fact, I think they all work against us. I mean, is there even any hope for these organizations? If there's possibility for reform, both in its budget, its accountability, um, you know, and, and its functionality and how it operates for us to take seriously the significant amount of financial investment that we've placed in it. And I'm also troubled by their massive private uh, funding. On the surface, that sounds great. Mm-hmm. Hey, we've got all these philanthropic forces that are contributing to the World Health Organization. But I don't, you know, and in fact, I believe it could be as much as a, as a lion's share of their funding uh, wow. coming from sources. Yeah. And, and then, you know, from as far as countries go, of course, as, as is usual, the U.S. is the leading uh, financial contributor. I think we're contributing like almost 10 times what China's contributed. But, you know, the issue on the, on the private funding is you, you have all of these have they been evaluated for conflicts? Have they been, you know, evaluated for, um, you know, particularly commercial conflicts of, in, of interest or political conflicts of interest? You know, the thing I think we've learned about any donor-based organization is that it's very rare to see an organization that isn't ultimately influenced by its donors. So if its donors are saying, hey, we're going to contribute, but these are the th- priorities that we have and those priorities align with commercial uh, agendas or political agendas, that's also very troubling. Now, what about America? I mean, as far as the country goes? You've got to put basically the president's statement at the forefront of, you know, put America first. There's no doubt we have a need for an organization or organizations that are going to contribute to information, knowledge, uh, preventative steps uh, in the global public health realm. And I think it remains to be seen whether or not that can be done now any longer through the World Health Organization. Um, I didn't think they did well in the SARS pandemic either. And yet, if you go back and look at some of their vaccination work and other things, they did, you know, they do, it's not like they they have had their successes, you know, to be fair to them uh, historically, but not under this current director who, uh, is I think the first non-physician to even run the World Health Organization. And as far as the country goes, I mean, really, this has just upended the country. I mean, it's almost like impossible to uh, overstate the magnitude of influence that it's had. And, you know, we were, I think, beginning to push possible three percent GDP growth. We're now mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. clearly looking at consecutive quarters that are going to be negative. We have um, millions upon millions of Americans who have lost their jobs with questionable immediate opportunities for those to restart. Um, they Part of the goal here, I think, has been to keep individuals and employees connected to their positions of employment. And I think we've had some success, meaning as bad as this situation is, it could be immensely worse. 
Um, but there's a lot of rebuilding to do. Unfortunately, fortunately, I do think we have the right president um, in the White House to be able to accomplish that. Uh, his line that, you know, we did it before, we can do it again, I think is is true under his leadership. And I think he's got all the right instincts about how to go about doing that. There's there's immense <laughs> burdens on the state, on these state budgets. And some of these states like New York, like New Jersey, like California, were in really bad states before the coronavirus. And then these are three three states, particularly New York and New Jersey, that have just been hit so overwhelmingly by this. I will say on the positive side, like if you, I think there's a positive you can find in, in anything, anywhere, if you look hard enough. As much as I think everyone's looking for it, I don't think there's an extraordinary amount of partisanship in the way this has been addressed hmm. um, for the most part. I think you've seen an early desire by Democrats to want to dig in and not cooperate with the, with the administration. I, th- I think they quickly saw that that wasn't working. Trump's support throughout it has remained strong. In fact, his support for the management of this crisis is even a point or two ahead of his overall support. And I think that's led to a scenario in which uh, Mnuchin and other administration officials, including the president, obviously have been able to finalize some really major pieces, almost unprecedented uh, in nature of economic relief and stimulus for the country. A lot of these are loans, not grants. Um, I, I, I think there were a lot of lessons learned from the 2008 and nine uh, housing crisis and the fact that um, we needed to hold individuals accountable and focus on on aid and relief that was both targeted and narrow in scope. Um, I think we've done a much better job as a country this time around than we did that time around. Uh, but the magnitude of impact in this is so pervasive that it's clearly now from a public policy and political agenda going to dominate the you know, lawmakers and, and, and Washington, D.C. for the um, clearly the remainder of the year. The A.J. Steele Show will be right back. All I really want to be is the guy that gets the girl. The A.J. Steele Show. Think of your loudmouth best friend, hated by all the wives, because he tells it just like it is. Finally see your love belongs to me. Our interview with Michael Johns continues. Well, don't forget, we did spend a lot of money, money we didn't have, I think about $3 trillion at this point. And uh, I think whenever you have an intersection of politics and money and science, then you start having problems. Now, as someone who's dealt with large-scale infection control issues in the past, I can tell you that there's no need to isolate healthy, non-immunocompromised people, but instead you try your best to protect the elderly and other high-risk groups. I never said or thought that the virus was a hoax, but I believe that the panic and the hysteria over this disease which much like the common flu kills less than one half of 1% of all infected people is possibly a crime and definitely a national shame. Do you think there's something more sinister going on here? Well, I think what is sinister is China's role in this, which is yet to be fully defined. They clearly, you know, almost in in the the most benign explanation is that they sought to conceal vital information from the world. And of course, there's more sinister explanations and it is hugely politically and otherwise convenient for certain constituencies around the world. And I can understand that there's a great degree of skepticism and, and cynicism and uh, thinking along those lines. But in essence, we have a pandemic a virus that has affected over 100 countries. Mm-hmm. It's affected a, mil- a one million case, over one million cases now in the United States and counting within a period of, what, 10 weeks, it's over 60,000 deaths. I, from the very beginning, got a lot of inquiry about this because of the perceived negative political impact it was going to have on individual liberties Mm -hmm. and the perceived negative political impact, which I don't think it's had, but many thought would have on on the president who I supported. And 
you know, I really looked at this and I, I, uh, and I've looked at it real carefully. I mean, I do think it's, it's serious, it's real, and it's a disservice potentially not to take it that way. One of the reasons that I think the president's been able to sustain the support that he has throughout the country and the Democrats don't have more talking points on them is that they have taken it so seriously. Now, the debate, and we'll look back on this historically and obviously ask ourselves, do we potentially go too far in these restrictive measures and policies? And this is always a balancing act between preserving the country's economy and economic interests and jobs and preserving the public health. And very interestingly, even in the clinical world, I'm starting to see some studies that emerge and say, you know, almost forget about the economy, that the idea of isolation um, and stay-at-home orders are, you know, potentially as troubling, if not more troubling, than they would be without that. Now, it's an intriguing question, but there are a lot of emerging issues as it relates to social anxieties and depression and suicide and possible opioid and drug abuse and domestic uh, violence, which has actually gone up hugely. A lot of issues that have emerged, you know, there's a lot of complicating factors here. I do think that, like, to the credit of this president, the earliest instinct he had, which was reflected in the January 31 decision to cut off travel to China, was just still to this date the singular most important step um, that could be uh, taken. And I like some of the work now that's coming out. I'm following with great interest and support the Heritage Foundation's coronavirus task force that they've set up. They have a five-point plan, basically, that would lead us through this to, to the reopening of the economy, looking at both the public health dimension of it and also looking at the economy. And look, they're, they're perspective, um, which I think is data-based, is that you have these two states in New York and New Jersey that comprise like over 40% of the cases, both total cases and total mortality rate from coronavirus, and uh, then sort of the rest of the country, which kind of falls into a, a kind of series of categories. But you get a broad number of, of states where, where this is not particularly prevalent or threatening, and where this economy, those economies, those state economies could reopen almost immediately with reasonable preventative measures. You know, clearly um, you're going to have to have steps in place, both testing and reporting and, and the contact tracing that are so important to continue to slow the spread and to maintain the progress that, that ultimately we make here. The rest of these steps ultimately rely a great degree on on science and in fairness to our government we're facing a pandemic from a virus we haven't confronted before i absolutely agree that this virus is unprecedented but from a practical point of view we have to reopen our country i mean our economy is completely shut down we have tens of millions of people on unemployment and millions of businesses on the brink of bankruptcy and we've lost billions or trillions i should say in stock valuations Michael, what kind of a reopening of America do you envision? And do you foresee a serious recession or even a depression like some economists are predicting? Well, the idea behind most of the small business dedicated stimulus has been to afford small businesses, which are the backbone of employment in this country. I mean, large companies receive all the attention, but... Ultimately, when you break down the question of where do American people work, they work in small businesses in, in, in um, large scale numbers. And the unfortunate reality of most small businesses is they don't have the lines of liquidity or financial flexibility that a large publicly traded company would traditionally have. And so affording them the kind of support that has been given and that in theory will continue to be provided for some duration of time is absolutely vital to minimize the bleeding. And obviously, as you correctly point out, it doesn't stop it completely. We've lost an extraordinary number of jobs because some of these are industries and companies that just absolutely had to sh completely shut down. They lost their entire revenue stream um, as a 
result of this. And I think there's, I think on to you know, to be fair about it, everyone wants to say it. Here's, you know, the answer uh, A or B. The key here is to get these businesses back up and running as quickly as possible. Um, it's there's there's large numbers literally every day in the absence of that revenue stream uh, stream that run risks of bankruptcy and, and lack of continuation and to keep individuals attached to the employment, which is one you know so there's a lot of things there like for instance one of the president's great inst- instincts originally which he hasn't gotten was the payroll tax mm-hmm. you know so to the extent individuals are still being paid it's should be a starting point to allow the american worker to keep more of what they're actually earning by suspending or cutting substantially the payroll tax i would favor a suspension of it frankly uh until such time at least until such time as the economy recovers well michael we both know that the president called for a payroll tax suspension but nancy pelosi and all the democrats are holding that up They want more freebies for the states and the cities. They're not so worried about business. They don't seem to understand business. They don't seem to understand that business drives everything, including tax revenue. So the question remains, who's going to push this recovery along? Is it going to be the cities? Is it going to be the states or the federal government? Ultimately, we're going to search for national answers to uh, on, the, on the reopening. But I think ultimately here, the federalist approach is is the one you have to take because i mean you can look at some of these regions and states that you know really today are as bad off as they've been since the beginning of this those aren't great in number but they exist and then you can look at you know really a large part of the country that where it either never was an enormously prominent public health threat few states fall in that category or where it appears to be stabilizing and improving. And those states have just got it got to be reopening. And, you know, and I'm troubled really be, behind a lot of the legal questions that have emerged here, because they're not all just questions of the economy. There's also fundamental questions of constitutional liberties. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. followed today, the uh, hairdresser in Dallas given seven days of jail time because she reopened her um, salon. And, you know, you would expect, um, you know, I... Obviously, like many liberty-minded individuals, very sympathetic with their plight. On the other hand, um, kind of not terribly pleased with the way a lot of these orders have been handled. You know, I don't think they've given courts uh, who are charged with enforcing this appropriate guidance on what leverage they have to actually enforce it. Just it's there's a lot of like on the on the local levels, especially in the municipalities and the county level, just. Lots of questions that have emerged and some real fundamental First Amendment, even Second Amendment questions as it relates to religious religious liberty, the right of the American people to congregate and petition their government, um, to protest, to purchase uh, guns. Um, gun stores have been, you know, deemed non-essential in a lot of a lot of areas where other commercial uh, and retail enterprises have remained opening. And those are all really troubling You know, questions that go right to the core of this Constitution. We'll be right back with Michael Johns on the A.J. Steele Show for a discussion of the Tea Party movement and A.J.'s mother-in-law. Don't go anywhere. You are listening to the A.J. Steele Show, where no topic is off limits, no discussion too harsh, no truth more true. The A.J. Steele Show, we tell it like it is. Michael, you're one of the original founders of the National Tea Party. It's a movement that my mother-in-law, God rest her soul, loved so much. She used to have the hat, the flags, and she used to talk to me about it all the time. She was a very, very, very lovely lady. And you're talking about the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, and now you're talking about the Constitution. I think that in many ways, the Tea Party movement was a prelude to President Trump's election. But is the Tea Party even relevant today? Is it relevant in the year 2020? Well, the Tea Party um, is hugely relevant and in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, number one, 
in my judgment, I don't believe I'm overstating this, um, this country was saved by the Tea Party movement. If it hadn't been for the 2010 Tea Party wave of political victories that took back the House and fired Nancy Pelosi, we would have had a complete green light with no political impediment to um, Barack Obama's radical agenda. As it was, Obama really, even though he talked about transforming the country, was blocked at every step by the Tea Party movement for uh, six of the eight years of his presidency. And I have said before, I don't really believe there's much in this country aside from Obamacare, which is weaker than it's ever been, and participation levels are minimal enthusiasm for the programs, minimal, um, the mandate to participate in it no longer exists. And when that, when the president got, Trump got rid of that, a lot of participation went down aside from that, really, there's not a whole lot that's been transformed at all in the country. And, um, a lot of that is a fact, well, not a lot of it completely. That is a product of the tea party political victories in 2010. Then you go to 2014 and, uh, realize that, um, you know, we promised we'd take the government back. Mm. I uh, was among the first to say that that was the goal of our Tea Party movement. And um, I am usually pretty careful with my verbiage and not wanting to overstate conditions or misrepresent goals. But I, I knew that's what the American people wanted. I knew that anything short of that was not going to lead to the massive level of political engagement that we wanted. We're talking about a movement at a time when there appeared to be no political hope for anyone of centrist or um, much less right of center political perspectives that opened an opportunity for tens of millions of Americans to become politically involved. And in many cases, those were individuals who had never been politically involved before in their lifetimes. And not for lack of desire, but for lack of any immediate avenue or opportunity for them to become involved. Um, our political party systems, it's kind of true of both parties in a lot of ways, don't offer the, the, the mechanisms for grassroots involvement that they should offer. That should be a core functional role of a political party. And um, I don't think it's been true of either major party. And it clearly wasn't perceived to be true of the Republican Party back then. And so that opportunity existed for tens of millions of Americans to get involved. So we had the House victory in 10. We had the Senate victory in 14. Senate victory, of course, blocked a lot of the judicial, more radical judicial mm -hmm. nominations to the point where Obama just at some point stopped sending up these people that were you know, too far radically left, knowing they weren't going to go anywhere. And then I think, as you say, 16, I mean, you can't help but look at – the tactics that were utilized by the president that continue to be utilized politically by the president and realize they mirrored a lot of the tactics that we identified as being some six successful ones, large uh, grassroots related rallies and communication and engagement um, calls to action, heavy reliance on social media, mm. um, a great degree of uh, connection with the people. That was the key, and that was the key to the emergence of many of our respective political victories. And, you know, it's not pretty – it's not widely known enough, but President Trump spoke at um, Tea Party rallies in um, South Florida 2011. Um, he always spoke positively and was supportive of our Tea Party movement. I always appreciated that, it was, and I endorsed him on day one, as you may know. It was mm. not a – too many in, in politics there's too many cases where people you know it's like favor given favor returned mm -hmm, it wasn't mm -hmm. that i felt he had done us a favor and i was returning the favor i just always had a positive feeling from day one that he had the temperament the instinct and the and the policy agenda most importantly of focusing on these trade issues on these immigration themes on the border and on the need to re kind of restore the Republican Party is a party of working Americans, which it had, I think, ceased being before him, that those were all core components to our ability to be politically relevant on a national level and to win and to be competitive. 
also not broadly known. He was, you know, in most of the polling among self-identified Tea Party voters, favored candidate from day one. Interesting. Uh, favored, it, hugely interesting. Hugely interesting because you look at the fact that he had three opponents that were elected as Tea Party candidates and Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and Rand Paul. Um, and I will tell you, you know, in the movement itself, you know, a lot of individuals, particularly because they'd worked closely with those three guys and thought highly of them. And, you know, I, I've worked with them and think highly of them, too. Um, it, it just wanted to gravitate to them because of that fact. But it was Trump who led. And then that lead that he had at the very beginning among Tea Party voters really only expanded. As he as his message got out and as people began began to see that he had a certain fearlessness, he had a certain mm. um, steel spine, uh, he was prepared to return punches with which I think, honestly, we don't talk enough about that. But the typical Tea Party voter out there and they're not looking for a fight, but they were tired of seeing us kicked around and taking unfair attacks, unfair uh, messaging, unfair allegations, and not returning anything. Oh, oh, absolutely. I think that President Trump was like the natural extension of the Tea Party. In some ways, he was like the baby that the Tea Party bore. And uh, I think you might be missing one more thing, and that's charisma. So I think Ted yeah. Cruz is a great guy, and I think Rand Paul is a great guy. Uh, Marco Rubio, I'm not a huge fan, but I respect some of his positions. But I think uh, what you're talking about, Trump is earthy. He had something that appealed to the everyday American and exactly the kind of people that you're talking about that were tired of taking crap from people and didn't know how to channel it. Well, I, and I think a, thir a certain authenticity, really, you mm -hmm. know, of an maybe imperfect man prior to his political career who had learned a lot from working with a broad range of diverse people who is not a product of the beltway. I'll tell you, having spent enough time down there in major positions, it's very difficult to change Washington from Washington. It's, I've always said the change in Washington has to come to Washington, not from it. And I think the American people were wise enough to see that too. Remember we were fresh off the candidacies of um, John McCain and Mitt Romney, mm -hmm. and if you went through the, uh, if you if you listen carefully to the electoral history I gave of the Tea Party movement, I went 2010, 2014, 2016. I sort of skipped over 2012, and one of the reasons I skipped over it was because we had a broad number of uh, political victories around the country that year. Mitt Romney's apparent unwillingness to reach out and work with the National Tea Party movement, in my view. Um, cost him that election straight up. There were simply a solid seven-figure number of Republicans who did not go out and vote that day, who were predisposed to support him, but were not sufficiently motivated to support him. Mm. And that's a big part of political polling. That's one of the reasons I'm confident about the president's re-election in um, 2020 is the fact that, you know, well, you're going to see these polls and you'll see them throughout November 3rd that show, you know, Biden and and um, Trump uh, running close or whoever the Democratic nominee ends up being, because it may not be Biden, but, you know, whatever the scenario ends up being, you'll see this close. But there is also the enthusiasm polling. And when mm -hmm. you get into the enthusiasm polling, you see, well, Trump's up like 20 points, you know, in some of these cases, meaning meaning a typical voter who supports Trump is vastly more enthusiastic about their support for Trump than someone who says to a pollster that they support Biden, who may honestly just not be terribly excited or enthusiastic about that support. And those are the type of voters who, when it comes to election day, often just sit it out. So speak of elections, and we have one coming up very soon, as you just said. What do you think about Joe Biden, and do you have any guesses who he's going to pick, or who will the Democratic Party pick as his running mate? Yeah, I got a broad number of thoughts about Joe Biden. Uh, number one, uh, he's been in American politics for over forty years, literally going on half a century, and I can't name anything in this country 
aside from maybe some Amtrak funding and a few other minor things, it's terribly different because of his involvement. Um, I think his career, I hate to wrap someone's, you know, that magnitude of time and say, look, it was all for nothing. But I, you know, you honestly have to be objective about it and say he's been successful from the standpoint of obtaining positional authority, but that's not the metric that the American people look at. That might be the metric that Washington DC looks at, mm. but the American people look at that and go, well, what have you really done in you know, all this time through the, these multitude of, of um, positions and elections that you've held? You have nothing but opportunity to, to influence the direction of the country and just, you know, really not a lot. And then you look at some of the particular positions that he's taken, which make this an entirely different election really in the sense that um we're going to have a democrat nominee who was a huge proponent of nation building in the middle east and of the occupation and presence in iraq uh, against president trump who was skeptical throughout of it and has taken steps to remove our engagement there that's intriguing it's a complete reverse of the traditional partisan divide on that issue um the same is true frankly of medicare and social security statement after statement and effort after effort where biden i guess thinking that he was somehow being bold um sought out to to cut social security and medicare benefits for um, elderly americans and as you know Whatever you think of these programs, and they are a large part of our, our federal budget, they're contributory programs. It, people have paid into them like they would pay into an IRA or a 401k. They're, they're core foundations of a majority of the country's retirement plans. I mean, I just – I've never been comfortable with that one component of some conservative and libertarian thinking on it. And I'm so ecstatic to see a president who's basically just taking the lead and saying, no, we're, we're just simply not going to cut those two programs. This is the A.J. Steele Show. When we get back, we're going to hear Michael Johns talking about Joe Biden, President Trump's outreach to the African-American community, and his personal recollections of President Bush. I don't AJ Steele, not right, not left, just right. Don't like Ollie, don't sing like Howard, and don't cry like a pussy. I think there's two words to describe Joe Biden. One of them is mediocre, which is what he is. Uh, everything you talked about, all his achievements or lack of, testify to that. And the other word is spineless. I think that he's the kind of politician that will say and do anything to get elected. I don't think he stands for anything. There's not much authenticity there, especially since his positions seem to shift by the day. And the voters know that. But for some reason, it seems like him and a Democratic Party have a complete hold over the African-American voter. What do you think about President Trump and the relationship he has with African-Americans? This is a bold statement, what I'm about to say, and I knew some would take issue on it. But if you really think about it, I think it's true. Donald Trump has done a lot more for African-Americans in this country than Barack Obama did in eight years. Um, and I, I just simply think if you looked at the state of African-Americans by any metric when Obama left office in January of 2017 and compared it to when he arrived in January 2009, whether it was welfare dependency, food stamps, unemployment, wages – education standards, crime, neighborhood infrastructure. I, I mean, it was anywhere from just as bad as it was to, in a lot of cases, worse than it was. Oh, absolutely. And uh, there's a saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. Part of the issue is it hasn't always lifted all boats. So when we put forward, for instance, our supply side thinking in the 80s, which I found to be rational and sensible, and there was some truth to it, but it, it wasn't universally true, meaning you, we've seen, like, for instance, that you can cut these capital gains tax rates. You can cut highest marginal rates. 
saying it's going to spark investment and employment and higher wages. And then, you know, you'll get the results where some of these things will happen a little bit, but, you know, you also have like stock buybacks and money that goes mm-hmm. offshore. And so like, I think for us to be relevant, politically relevant and real, sometimes we need to take a fresh look at, at our ideology and the way things are actually working. And there too, I think we got a president who's saying, look, it's about our country and low and middle income Americans and those on disability and those who long-term unemployed and there's still a lot of the lot of them and now a whole fresh new grouping of them True. really require attention um, because we have not either party been able to sort of solve the the puzzle on how to create a clear path out of that. There's a lot of rhetoric um, from liberal Democrats about their commitment to it. They have zero track record of accomplishing it. And I think on our side, there's there's rhetoric about what not to do, but less focus on what to actually do. And I, so I like the criminal justice reform. I like enterprise zones and cities Mm -hmm. and, you know, creating incentives for capital to flow into some of these areas that need it most. We definitely, um, money's not the only answer to education. There's some very well-funded public education systems that are also failing. But I think we have to be honest that some of these schools are, are struggling from a funding standpoint. And they shouldn't be, and that needs to be addressed. Inner city crime is an issue. Obviously, we've got a major drug and opioid problem that's improved a bit under this president's watch, but it's still a major, it's being described as the other pandemic, the other coronavirus, Mm. and it's taken an extraordinary number of lives. And, you know, now I'm kind of worried as we enter into the darkness of individuals uh, who've lost jobs or face divorces or had uncertainty in their lives, that's the climate in which a lot of drug abuse ultimately arises and addiction issues arise. And I just hope that we're focused on that on a federal, state, and community level. We have resources available for individuals and um, are pushing to try to make sure that we don't see any regression in the opioid crisis in this country. You touched on something very interesting. In some ways, you're attacking uh, Reaganomics. You're attacking the pillar of the Republican Party or the trickle-down uh, theory. But you also worked as a speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush. I know I'm changing topics a little bit, but what can you tell me about him as a man and as a president? Well, I think from a standpoint of positional authority, he was probably the most qualified president of our lifetimes. You know, he'd run the CIA, he'd run the Republican National Committee, he was a congressman from Texas, he was um, ambassador to China, a lot of people forget, um, at, a sens- at a sensitive time. And I guess every time has been sensitive, really, with our relationship with China, but a sensitive time in our relationship with China. And he, um, you know, had a private sector career and had a great degree of commitment and passion to public service and an extraordinary understanding of global and world affairs. Um, I mean, he was an undeniable expert on foreign policy. And so a lot of my views, like I, I think we've been fortunate to have a few presidents now, and I would cite Reagan, I would cite Bush 41, and I would cite um, Trump, and I would possibly even cite Bush 43 to some extent, who sort of fit the moment of what we needed at that time. And I've often said about, about Trump, as loyal as I am, and I think I'm as loyal of a supporter as anyone, I mean, day one, and um, at a moment when I don't think anyone anticipated him even securing, coming close to securing the nomination. <laughs> My reason for supporting him was I thought he was raising these issues in trade and immigration um, that were at the core of the, of the erosion of middle class earnings and were affecting low and middle income working Americans. And he had, the, I thought, the key to resolving that. And, you know, at the time, you know, in the Bush White House, and you're obviously looking at the end of the Cold War and, you know, the management of that. I don't think enough can be said. Um, I always say Reagan won the Cold War, but Bush sort of managed 
the closing of that chapter peacefully, and it could have very easily gone differently. I mean, realize we're talking and still are talking about a nuclear power whose entire, you know, essentially unnatural empire collapsed in um, a series of weeks and months. And there were an extraordinary number of very powerful people within the Soviet system and within its historical power centers and within the Communist Party, who obviously were directly affected in very negative ways by that. I think President Bush's ability to navigate that period of moment in American history to to the point where we had literally the end of the Cold War, which has defined uh, um, geopolitics really since World War II, post-World War II era, in a peaceful way, and not just a peaceful way, but in a way that actually gave the emergence of some political liberalization in some of these countries, not all of them. Some of them have regressed since then. But the, the point being, you really had at that moment, if you think back, kind of a flourishing optimism about what the possibilities existed uh, within the world, absent the traditional Soviet-U.S tensions, military and otherwise, and the fact that political liberalization seemed to be broadly embraced, not just in the Warsaw Pact, but in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, to, it sort of inspired a generation of political leadership at that time when um, I think that was very much needed. And so that was an immense accomplishment. You can have the best plans, but um, uh, what was the uh, Mike the Mike Tyson line? Everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. <laughs> he said, you, "You know, uh, you know." Interesting. Speak of sports analogies. It sounds like you're describing a president who was a great manager. And you think of quarterbacks who are great managers, but you never remember those guys. You always remember the quarterbacks that go out of their way and do crazy things. Is that a fair analogy? It is. Look, let me be honest. Like. Um, I was I was a Reagan Republican when I was a Bush Republican. I didn't have anything against Bush's selection back in 1980. I can remember I was like in high school and I was just starting to get politically intrigued by all of that. And I remember the reasoning behind it. And I remember the surprise. I mean, if you can recall, Bush was, I think, at a bar thinking he had uh, not just lost the nomination, but he was not going to be selected. And he was. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I think True. it was in Detroit. And, you know, it was. It, you know, and then he faithfully served Reagan for eight years, meaning that's the role of vice president is a very difficult role. Functionally, its powers and authorities are never well defined. They're kind of assigned to that person. Um, victories are always attributed to a president, not a vice president. And when things go wrong, it's very easy to have see internal fingers pointed at a vice president. And here you had, you know, two individuals within the Republican Party who, to be blunt about it, had a great personal relationship. And most people knew Reagan had a great personal relationship with Reagan because um, he's a likable guy. Yes. But from the standpoint of ideology, you had a real conservative purist who sort of go back to his you know, original speech to the nation on Goldwater, you know, who had mm -hmm. really uh, at the founding of contemporary conservatism, I put him right there with those names. He was the political part of the Buckley generate Buckley Goldwater mm -hmm. generation of modern conservatism. This is the AJ Steele show. Stick around to listen to Michael John's views on President Donald Trump. The AJ Steele Show. Think of your loudmouth best friend, hated by all the wives, because he tells it just like it is. Finally see your love belongs to me. We've covered a lot of presidents that you liked and even candidates like Goldwater and obviously President Reagan and Bush. And uh, we haven't talked much about Clinton, but we covered Obama a little bit. But President Trump is kind of an enigma. He doesn't fit the conservative side. He doesn't fit the liberal side. 
and yet you really support him. What made you see the light? It's kind of intriguing to me how political leaders can rise, how the moment is almost created for a certain personality. And I think that's what I saw in Trump in June of 2015, is that this was a man who was made for this moment in American history. I couldn't see any one of those other, I think it was 16 other candidates, some of whom I've known for a long time, all of whom were great individuals and mm -hmm. had probably constructive objectives and plans. But there was too much Washington in all of them. And we, we need at this moment the sort of guy who's going to go in there and um, rip some things out by the roots. You know, and so that, that process has begun. No one thought it was going to happen in a year or two years. This is definitely an eight-year, not a four-year plan. <laughs> um, and uh, there's been some setbacks. Obviously, these two uh, major, you know, investigation and impeachment and efforts and yeah. hugely distractions, I think, to national political leadership for any president, um, even though I think Trump's handled both of them very well. Uh, and I think he started to uh, now, I think, got some refound energy as it relates to the fact that this administration also needs to be looked at more carefully from a personnel standpoint. You know, we got people in mm -hmm. this government probably shouldn't be in this government. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people mm -hmm. should be in it who aren't. And I, I think he's got a re I think the coronavirus has put a, a newfound sort of sense of urgency in getting a lot of these positions filled with people who are competent and aligned with um, Trump's vision for the country. I think that Reagan and Trump are definitely analogous in some ways. They were both meat and potato kind of guys with great instincts. Getting back to George Bush just a tiny bit, you did work for him for a while, and I like him. I think he was a decent man, but his policies were more in line with like the globalist approach of the anti-Trump wing of the Republican Party. You know, Paul Ryan, John McCain, Mitt Romney's of the world. I know that President Bush didn't exactly embrace President Trump. And to be fair, Trump kind of beat up on his son Jeb pretty good. Do you see any connection between the globalist country club Republicans and what I call the nationalist Trump Republicans? Do they have anything in common? Well, probably not. Probably not a whole lot in common. Um, and, that, and I think, you know, my own views on this have evolved as well. I mean, I couldn't have imagined... You know, isolationist sentiments made no sense to me in the 1980s when we were confronting the magnitude of advance of the Soviet empire. It just uh, – any sensible thinking person was globalist by nature. And, you know, I focused on some of the even more remote areas of the Cold War in Latin America and Africa and South Asia that today don't – receive nearly as much attention as they used to. And today, I think we look at a world where U.S. domestic priorities, as this pre president's correctly stated, have been neglected for so long. And we've had the loss of major jobs and industries to unfair and, and aggressive trade policies from China and other nations that haven't been addressed. Part of that was you know, part of the Cold War as well. But today, our needs are very much domestic. Uh, it's job creation, it's economic growth, border security. I mean, I think the president's right when we talk about we talk about the fact that we've gone to war over borders around the world, and we can't. We've chosen. It's not. We can't. We've chosen not to defend our own, which is absurd. We're in a position in the 21st century where, from NATO to um, other defense alliances around the world, you know, uh, these are developed countries now. This isn't the post-World War II era or even the post-Cold War era. These are countries of immense economic means, and they have what are now more regional than they are global security challenges. And we need to be a part of that. We need to be involved in it, and we certainly should never seek to leave NATO or disband NATO, but the idea that uh, NATO member countries should put up 2% of GDP toward the common defense of Europe seems a pretty reasonable idea. The fact that Europe, one of the great engines of the global economy, still to this day is putting under 2% into NATO should be troubling to every American. So I think we have you know, some big issues there. Uh, but the security challenges have changed, and the security challenges, I think, are much more now focused around 
China's emergence in the 21st century um, and the threat that they represent on every front, a geoeconomic threat, a geopolitical threat, an informational warfare threat, cyber crime threat, global development threat with the work they're doing in, in Africa, Asia, and in some of these very complicated but immensely troubling global development programs where countries are having to put up you know, their own assets as collateral and are yeah, I mean, even, even Europe, places like Italy, and uh, definitely you talked about Asia and Africa, but the Chinese are, their footprint is everywhere. They're uh, mirroring something that we probably did after World War II. I think they are a danger, and I think if economically they destroy us, then it can destroy us militarily, and I think President Trump really gets it. Yeah, he does. This is a very different threat from China than I think the threat we faced from the former Soviet Union when, you know, the Soviet Union rolled into Kabul, Afghanistan, tanks. I mean, it was, anybody could watch, could have watched that on the news back in 1979. And, and it was just like such a perfect capsule of what we confronted, which was a military power that was not bashful about utilizing that military power for the purposes of advancing its geopolitical agenda. Uh, China's also an extraordinary military power, and I would never diminish the military threat they present, but the magnitude of their threat is much more diverse than simply one of their military, even though they have the two million plus now members in their the PLA, their military, and the largest you know armed force in the uh, world. But we continue to be ahead of them in, in major strategic and tactical areas that I think um, continue to be important. So, you know, sort of to your question of the globalist versus the nationalist, all things preferred. I think we have a country that, that to this day would continue to love to not be concerned about all these things that happen around the world, be nothing better. And that was sort of part of the promise with the end of the Cold War. But that maybe we were going to enter a, a situation like that. But, um, and I can remember there was a, a DC um, think tank guy who wrote a pretty famous article then called The End of History. Basically, this was the end of conflict, the end of any need, really, ultimately, for the United States to be engaged in these uh, episodic conflicts and power struggles. And of course, um, that uh, defied sort of the the instincts of of leaders and countries and powers and i think these are going to you know, we're always going to have global challenges and global threats that we're going to need to confront and obviously what china is doing what they're doing with their navy what they're doing with their military buildup what they're doing with cyber theft what they're doing in um their biochemical areas the role they may have had in this coronavirus uh, hmm. which you know, it's possible that it was more malicious than it's been defined and the um, and the South China Sea. I mean, we've over three trillion dollars in transport that goes through there. So I think it's like forty percent of the liquefied natural gas of so the world goes through there, and they're creating new islands and violating territorial regions and and waterways controlled by the Philippines and Vietnam, and Brunei, and Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, Australia, I believe. You know. Um, and uh, doing it with pretty much reckless abandon. This is the AJ Steele Show. I hope you stick around and listen to the final segment of our fascinating interview with Michael Johns. You're listening to the AJ Steele Show, where no topic is off limits, no discussion too harsh, no truth more true. The AJ Steele Show, we tell it like it is. Oh, absolutely. I think China is the new evil empire. And we could talk about these geopolitical issues all day, but we do have to wrap up our interview pretty soon. I have a last couple of questions for you. And uh, one of them is this. What can the average American who listens to the AJ Steele show do to make sure that our beliefs are heard and that President Trump is reelected, Michael? 
Well, my best advice is between now and November to become as politically active and involved in your local community as possible. You can do that through local Tea Party organizations. You can do it through the Republican Party. You can do it through other advocacy organizations, or you can do all the all the above, which is kind of what I recommend. Get involved locally. I mean, a lot of people complain about government on a local, state, and national level, but you know, ultimately, what is government? It's people. And um, if you don't like the direction that things are going, um, don't be hesitant to uh, to run for office. Too many Americans look at it and say, well, that's just not for me, or I don't understand how that works, or it's, um, you know, it's more than I can potentially grasp or understand. That's not true. You can pick it up, and there's people like me who do nothing but try to encourage and help and be a resource to individuals of goodwill who do that sort of thing. And then, you know, look, it, it's so obviously stated and repeated so frequently, but you got to get out and vote, um, you know, vote in your primary, vote for them on, on this election day, make sure you're supporting congressional candidates who are going to support his agenda in Washington, because there's only so much a president can do in and of himself. And uh, we have an opportunity potentially to pick up some Senate seats and I think to take back the House even, and um, but that's going to require, you know, an extraordinary amount of political engagement in all of these districts. There's th- over 30 districts where, believe it or not, the president won in 2016 that are represented by Democrat mm-hmm. members of Congress, almost all, I believe all of whom voted to impeach president. That's just an incredible paradox and an incredible paradigm that you would have such contradictory agendas. And I think the fact is you've got members of Congress in those districts who, for the most part, don't represent the the real sentiments of those districts who want a member of Congress who's going to work with this administration, not be resistance oriented, not be an obstructionist, not come back and brag that my biggest accomplishment was I made nothing happen. That's not <laughs> leadership. That's just obstruction. I have a final question. Do you feel positive with the direction our country is headed and what kind of future do you envision for America? Well, um, our future and our liberty, as Reagan said, is not passed from generation to generation in the bloodstreams of Americans. It has to be fought for and protected in each generation. I feel that we've done some fairly extraordinary things in defending those liberties, particularly, I have to say, I think it really kind of starts with at least modern times with the work of the Tea Party movement. And there's work ongoing, but the threats also don't stop, you know? So the future of the country, you know, to be realistic about it, is what we're going to make of it and what we commit ourselves to doing. If we ever reach the point where a lion's shares of Americans become ambivalent about the direction of responsive government or the Constitution or our sovereignty, as I think is always an ongoing risk. It won't be a positive one. If we remain adamant and engaged in defending those things, there should be a continuing um, ascending star of global leadership. This is still the greatest country in the world. Everyone wants to come here. Everyone wants to be a part of it. The American dream is is recognized. It's real. It's not imagined. And uh, we've got abundant challenges and problems. But we've historically, you know, had those like any other country. And I believe they can be resolved, constructive. And I would emphasize collaborative engagement, meaning um we sometimes get really constructive engagement, but people are working in isolation. They're not working together. Ultimately, it'd be effective. We got to all work together and support each other, communicate and collaborate toward these common ends. Michael, from your mouth to God's ears. Now, if people want to read what you have to say, uh, do you have any websites or are you on Twitter? Could you please tell us about those? Yeah, best ways to follow me on Twitter. I am at Michael Johns, one word. Um, on Facebook, Michael Johns Tea Party, one word. And on YouTube, Michael Johns, one word. 
Michael, thank you so much for your time. I wish you all the best, and I appreciate you coming on our show. I really appreciated talking with you and um, and um, enjoyed it very much. Thanks for having me. All I really want to be is a guy that gets the AJ Steele Show, copyrighted 2020.